Ben Wood, Director of the Board of Health, and Daniel, Daniel Washington. Health Inspector. Explain your last name. W A S I U K. You think I would have got that right? <laughs> okay, Ben, you're going to give us a yearly update on the department activities and the Board of Health Actions. Take it away? Take it away. All right, so uh, last year when I came, I felt like I just talked a lot and there wasn't much time for any discussion. So I decided what I decided to do this time is kind of scale it down a little bit and, and just, um, you know, go over some, some key initiatives and things that we're working on and then um, I think that will be roughly short and then if there are questions discussion we can That's obviously great. have. Um, and I asked Daniel to come just because uh, Daniel is most intimately associated now with all of our food establishments that are answering the food in particular food related questions. He's the best able to answer them. I think, I think that's good because I've talked with him several times on the phone. Yes. And now I see his face yes. and now I know who yeah, he is. Yeah, it's nice to, nice to have, you know, employees come and meet. Exactly. For sure. All right, so uh, the way I broke this up in terms of um, the health department is four sort of major categories of, of activity. The first being um, actions and, and programs related to um, food establishments, state, state sanitary code enforcement, Title V, which is um, uh, private sector systems, private sector systems and water quality related issues. And then uh, a category related to housing and complaints, a uh, category related to community and the category related to very broad um, uh, program area of community health and chronic disease prevention. Um, so going back up to the top, just talk a little bit about um, food establishments and state sanitary code enforcement stuff. Just in terms of uh, mandated activities, the, the department is, um, is, you know, with a good month of December, I think, uh, pretty much on track to meet um, state mandates for um, the number of inspections that we're supposed to be doing for um, for the establishments that we that we permit and license, um, and uh, relating to uh, um, Title V, it's been an incredibly slow year, which is you know obviously related to the continued um, downturn in the housing market. But it's even a lower year than last, which is which, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and then, um, are uh, we um, yeah. on the Title V? Are we still dealing with Amherst? They come in and inspect for Title V, or we have a shared inspector. So uh, we we have 20 hours. There's Daniel, and then there's a then there's a part-time uh, inspector, and that that part-time inspector is technically an employee of the town of Amherst. Um, but they're a 40-hour. They, you know, they were, he works 40 hours, 20 in Amherst, 20 in Northampton. Um, so both Daniel and Ed Smith, who's that who's the part-time person, do um, Title V enforcement, and Ed is a licensed soil evaluator. Um, which is a, a necessary certification that you, that you need to have um, for certain aspects of, of doing Title V work. But Daniel has plenty of experience. Daniel uh, worked for the um, town of Greenfield um, back in the early part of the 2000s for several years as a, as a health agent um, and then um, left that work to do um, private consulting uh, work around food safety and food audits uh, and then came back. But as far as Title V goes, goes, what's your role? My role is the field work and review of the septic plants as they come into the office. So Daniel has Daniel has much more experience actually reviewing septic plants, um, but uh, his, his soil evaluator license lapsed, so he'll get that at some point in the future. Um, so it it's, so the, the work the work and the work is sort of combined between um, between Ed and Daniel doing percolation tests and, and actually reviewing plants. And that sort of thing. When did your license lapse? My license lapsed approximately 2006, 2005. And are you going to renew it? Yes, I'm going to renew it, yes. Yeah, but we don't need to have uh, more than one license so that's right around staff. That's not a, it's not a necessary piece to re yeah. reviewing separate right. plans and that sort of thing. So as far as your certification for, uh, for plan review? There really isn't there a, is there isn't a man. Just experience. Yeah. It's been an incredibly, incredibly slow year. Yeah, I think, that, I think, that, I think there's a nine permits that we've issued. 
That's I, it. I have That's usually done a half a dozen uh, septic systems by now in a year, and I've done two, both in Conway. Yeah, right. Yeah. I haven't so seen dry. any action no. going on in Ward 6. Nothing. Six there's there's nothing. Ed, Ed Smith was on a perk test all day today on a, on a new development, and that was the first time that we had a perk test in a couple months. months. <coughs> and I believe, the way it looks right now, according to Economic Research Institute, it's going to be worse next year. Possible. Yes. Mm. But we'll see. You're not yeah. the only one that says that. It's the engineers or two have indicated to me. Guys that do all the work and the, and the installers, that it, it's it's the next couple of years are going to be really dismal. Now is that, I mean, when we're talking about Title Five, we're talking about septic systems, so, right? Yes. So yep. we're talking about growth that is not connected to city sewer. Correct. So, yes. you know, yeah. the, the city's um, trying to encourage growth that in the right. city center uh, and uh, trying to discourage it in the uh, outskirts of town of uh, the city. So, you know, it, but it's, it could be, we could have a recession or not, and you could see a downward trend on Correct. title, on title yeah. five inspections, right? Correct. Yeah, it's uh, the, the way that it works though, you, when, when you have a, um, whenever a title changes hands, you have to have a title five inspection. So it's not just, it's not just new development, it's, um, it's inspections of existing systems. It actually ends up being most of the work. Um, so uh, systems that are in failure and those sorts of things. So existing yeah. systems that, that's about 10% of the parcels in Northampton are, um, are on septic, uh, private septic. So, so those will always exist in ten, unless basically like 10 houses have turned over that have septic systems. Uh, no, no, because some of those are new development. Right, but the repairs, fewer the repairs, the ones that, that fail when the Title five inspection is done, they have right. to repair it within a certain time. Yeah, many more, many more yeah. homes have turned over, oh, just those are the systems that, that the problems were identified yeah, and been. they had to install mm -hmm. or, or fix the existing system. Ward 6 has loaded its septic systems. Yes, Ward 6 Lawrence is Lawrence yes. Road, West Hampton Road, all over the place. And oh, yeah. Yeah, sure every time a house is up for sale, they were failing. And the cost was tremendous because I was Absolutely. getting calls on it. I think the highest one on West Hampton Road was the Herzog family. It was, the price was huge. What, $27,000? <coughs> oh, yes. They did get very expensive. Yeah, they did get very expensive. And that's really not that... Twenty-seven thousand. That's really a lot not that of money, big. Eugene. Uh, Thirty-six thousand. Oh yeah, some of the raised systems. Sure. Exactly. Mounds, That's what happened. Up in the thirties, forties. Sure. They Easy. made them not place it where the original one was. They made them go way back in their property, yeah. and thank God they knew a logger, so he made up the difference for them and took the logs and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gets extremely costly. A very costly, and on Florence where we just went through that. Guy called me last year. He had bought in the house, and the septic system failed. And he up and got that straightened out and put it up for sale. It's very well, any system that was installed in the '80s is not going to pass. Uh, they're probably going to find problems. <laughs> yeah, you get a 20 to 30 year life, sure, out of a septic system. You know, yeah. that's the norm, and that's yeah. contingent on manufacturers. But you get in the '80s. In the '80s, it's time. Yeah. Yeah. And regs are a lot stiffer now. Correct. Yes. Groundwater. Correct. Everything. The Title Five enactment. Sure. Yeah. Hmm. So, so people that are trying to sell their houses that have a septic yeah, system. Yeah. That's just yeah. Just like the case where yeah. Mary indicated, where it they open their eyes and say, goodness, yeah. look, look, you know, in comparison what they paid for the the, the uh, system previously, and now. And the bank doesn't want to talk to you until you've had it done. I usually like talking with the realtors out there. A friend of mine just sold her house, and she had her septic system checked two years ago, so she was okay. She made that deadline there, and she said she couldn't believe it. It had to be rechecked again more. Yep. Yes, that's, that's mandated. And banks won't move. Realtors will not move on it. Huh? No, <laughs> you know, they exactly. Won't. So... Um, just a couple of uh, three sort of areas that I wanted to highlight under this sort of big programmatic area, which actually ends up being an incredibly <laughs> large amount of, it, of health inspectors' um, time on a daily basis. Um, the first is related to, uh, to food safety. We decided that um, we would 
uh, enroll in what's called the Voluntary National Retail Food Regulatory Program. This is an FDA program, and it's basically what it is, is it's a, it's a voluntary program for um, regulatory authorities to enter into to enhance their, their food safety programs. Um, so we decided we would, we would go for it, even though the, um, the monetary um, reward for doing so is very small. It give you $2,500, which you can go towards um, um, purchasing equipment, basically. Uh, but we thought it was a good idea because we're um, we're noticing several trends in, on, in in food inspections that we would like to um, like to work on with our food establishments, and so this is an opportunity to, in a structured way, go through an assessment process about how exactly the health department does food inspections, um, and uh, to meet uh, what are these voluntary national standards for uh, retail food. Um, so we're going to be sort of jumping off and getting going with that process, really kind of kind of soon, and um, we're, we're choosing probably to focus on, um, on uh, working with uh, restaurants to develop what's called HACCP plans. Uh, and actually, I'll let you explain what a HACCP plan is. And it's, uh, a HACCP is a, a food safety management system. It's more technical than just the, uh, the regular inspection of work or, um, or just an inspection of a food service entity, where it focuses on primarily the operations of a restaurant, which may be indicative of causing a foodborne illness. And instead of doing the wall ceiling kind of uh, floor inspections, they, they are more focused on the food handling aspects, uh, time, temperature, cross-contamination, et cetera. So it, the, the FDA and the whole move of food safety in the last five years has been looking at this HACCP system Based type of inspections, where again the inspectors um, and even the, the the restaurant operators are looking at these practices, which have been scientifically proven of, of causing foodborne illness. Is it which way? HACCP. Yeah, Hassel. it's an acronym. It, it's it's hazardous, well yeah, yeah. Hazardous analysis critical control points. It was actually developed by NASA a long yeah, time ago. Analysis critical control points. Basically, it's finding it's finding the the point in your food operation that has the most potential for um, causing a foodborne illness, and developing basically developing procedures and plans to to identify those critical critical control points, Correct. and developing um, models of practice. Yeah, critical control them. points being temperature of the food, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah very much. Well, handling. handling yeah. It, so you you really uh, <laughs> you identify these these important risks and establish strategies to prevent their occurrence. And so you, don't, you don't chop the spinach where you cook the chicks. Cross contamination prevention, cooking temperatures. Uh, uh, a lot of there's probably ten really lar uh, important aspects of food production that have to be done. And if if those are done properly, you will uh, you will eliminate the risks to again all causing a foodborne illness. So what we're what we're doing in the the move uh, the scientific move. Uh, with, with health departments, local, state, and federal, are to, are to look at this, these intrinsic uh, operations and evaluate them and focus on, on, on those. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly there's a lot of other aspects in a restaurant that have to be looked at, but rather than looking at like a dirty hood or, or a soiled garbage can, get more in depth of the food safety aspects and more technical. And that's what we're the, what we're approaching. And hazard analysis, critical control. Yes. And yes. Say like with restaurants. Is it on your website yet? Because I know I asked you that last year. The inspections. Year. Yeah. The counting, but we but we decided that we're, uh, we're we're not sure yet if we want to actually put inspection reports up on. Uh, that's what you're Because I told you people were calling me yeah. and asking me which restaurants are safe to eat. Yeah, well, I, I can tell you all the restaurants are safe to eat at. I'm serious. All the restaurants are safe to eat at. Yeah. Um, I, you know, the, I, I go back and forth in my mind about whether or not I think posting the inspection reports online is really a good thing. Um, large cities are tending to go that way. Um, and I, I think that the relationship that is between a health inspector in New York City and, and a restaurant is very different from the relationship of a health inspector to a restaurant in Northampton. Um, and... Uh, I, when I first came on the job, I, I, I you know, I, I wanted to do that. I wanted to have a, a, a web-based 
basic sort of report card system for, for restaurants. I'm not, I'm not so sure anymore. And I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to hinder or help the relationship between the, the restaurant and the inspection, inspectional process. Um, and if I, if I think that it's in any way, shape, or form going to harm that, that relationship, I, I just don't think it's, it's, it's a good idea. I don't know what the answer to that to it is, um, because I, I, do, I do like, I, I mean, I personally, as just as a consumer, I like to be able to go to a, 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 a website or see posted on the, um, I was just in New York City a couple weekends ago, and I went, went, out, went out to a couple of different restaurants in Chinatown, and it was great to be able to see right there on the window their report card. Great. You know, I think that's like great. It's, that's, that's a C, great. that's a C, yeah. that's and an I think a. that's what people are looking um, for. Well, with all due respect to the citizenry, I think if you start putting that stuff on the website, I, do too. Uh, I think you may get inundated with calls about what does this mean, what does that mean, what does right. this mean, and, um, and, and then not only that too, you might like to see that because you're a professional and you know how to read it. You can read between the lines. You you can actually know what's on the report. As far as putting the entire inspection report on a yes. website, I think people will see what they want to see. And I think you might add a little fuel to some fire or something somewhere along the line. I, I, I definitely, if, if, we, if we went to an online reporting system or a system where you had to post a, something on, at your restaurant, it would never be the, re, the actual inspection report because you're 100% correct, but it's gobbledygook. Yeah. I you like the you one that you just you talked about make, in You New can't York. make heads or tails of really what, what the inspection report is telling you about the overall food safety fire. It's just, it's, it's too hard for a lay person to understand. Yeah. It, has, <laughs> it has to be an easily understandable system of, you know, <coughs> zero to 100 scale or a, you know, a basic report card of A, B, C, D, those sorts of things. Or we have inspected this particular or establishment and that it they meets passed. standards. Right. See, I, I I'd be happy important. with that. Right. It's important. Right. Because I received a call from one of my residents and they had eaten in a certain restaurant and one of them owns a clothing <coughs> store. <coughs> and they went to eat at a restaurant and they became very, very ill. One of them had to go by ambulance. And this was just recently, maybe about three weeks ago. Mm. That's why I'm questioning, I mean, are people going to be able to tell where it's safe? Well, we, I, I do, and I'm not saying this facetiously, I do think it's safe to eat at every establishment in the um, They, They have all, over the past uh, two years now, they have all been inspected pretty rigorously. And you're and, inspecting them, what, mandatory twice a year? Yes, but, you know, it, it, but it, they're, they're often getting inspected a lot more times than that because you know, there, there are re-inspections. Um, almost, it's, it's almost unheard of, actually, to, to sail through an inspection without a violation. And, right? And so, what, I'm, what was the, what's the percentage of, rest, of restaurants you go to that you do an inspection on? Uh, the just just probably 60, 70. Right. So, most, 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 uh, most establishments are getting mo many more than twice a year visits. And some establishments have pro more problems than others, and you know you have more consistent issues, and so they're getting a lot more visits. Right, because I know we were others. really behind on our inspections. Yeah. What well, is the frequency? Mm -hmm. The, the, the operators helps. here in the city do understand that they will be inspected. Uh, and truthfully, I, I, I agree with, with Ben. What, you know, I think what underscores the importance here is that not only um, the operators are, are uh, saying we're going to be inspected, but they have what I've deemed, have, have assumed that higher level responsibility and are adhering to good food safety practices. And I see that. I, and it's, it's the culture here in the city. So, when you're saying safety, now, we're going to talk about when we had the sidewalk sales, and they had all the food out there, and we actually saw, this is why you came, one of the employees grabbing a slice of pizza with his hand and then touching his nose. Okay? Unacceptable. It, it happens. It happens. But why don't they wear gloves? They, they, they should, but they don't technically need to wear gloves. They just cannot contact ready-to-eat foods with their bare hands. They're supposed to use deli tissue. They can use a napkin. They can use dispensing utensils. A tong, whatever. Tongs, yeah. yeah. A spatula, lifter. <coughs> and they're supposed to. And, I, you know, if something like that is seen, 
but the, the but the, that, the other thing is it. that it, it, you're, you're, you're right. And and predominantly, of the calls that we get are with individuals, food handlers uh -huh. contacting foods with their bank. Whether yes. it's it's you know uh, it's something that has happened and they weren't aware of it and that they made a mistake. Well, we look as is it a chronic issue? Meaning, we go to a restaurant. Uh, uh, are all the food handlers doing it, or they, was it just they a mishap? Be trained. Oh yes, absolutely. Do they have to wear gloves if they're going to touch food? No, they don't. They don't have to wear gloves if they if they touch food, but they can't touch foods with their bare hands. So, if you're going to if you're going to contact food directly, without any type of utensil or single service article, meaning deli tissue or uh, get a napkin or something. Yes, the only way is to don on gloves. Or if you're doing if you're handling raw food that you're planning on cooking. If you, could, you, you, know, don't, you don't have to. Again, it's, it's ready about, to eat right, foods. That's, that's, I think yeah, that's, the, that's what it is. If, if you go to a butcher shop, it, yeah, you, they, they don't have to. Uh, but certainly they have to wash their hands, uh, keep free of jewelry. Uh, do good practices. I mean, to prevent cross So I'm grilling a hamburger. I'm <laughs> grill in the diner. Okay. And I put the hamburger together. Yeah. Put any gloves on. Put it on a plate and send it out the window. That's wrong. Yeah. Well, if you put if you put the bread on with your hands, and let's say and you assemble it, yes, you have to wear gloves. That's it's not all over the city. Well, I mean, I I would. You are absolutely. Right. I I would. I, I I would. And I don't have any problem with it. I'm just saying. No, that's no, the law. That's the law. That is the law. That yeah. is the law. And what what happened in previous years? The the State Department of Health, they wrote up a policy which was an alternative policy to uh, bare hand contact. So when this no bare hand contact uh, policy came up, they put in a provision in the law to say. If, if operators put in this management system, institute use of sanitizer, do something similar to HACCP, do trainings, we'll let you, we'll let you uh, use, your, use your hands. Subsequent to that, I think a year or two, uh, there was an outbreak in Eastern Park, or, or a couple associated with food handlers, not mm -hmm. they were th These were sick individuals that had a communicable disease. Contacted mm -hmm. food, people got sick. They took away that policy. So now, it, it kind of threw everybody for a loop. That, that was allowed for a little while. It wasn't allowed, allowed, and then not allowed anymore. And now, now in, in the scheme of things, in food production, the way to put together a, a burger or a grinder without using, your, without using gloves, it cannot happen. You can, you can take lettuce and you can take you know the meats with a tongue but to assemble something like that can't happen but it what I can happen. tell you with my, what I can tell you with my inspections I seldom see individuals doing that without without gloves I have okay. and that does happen I I, I, I agree with you there, because there as is I, there is never going to be a, 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 any city in any city in the country that's going to have a, a, all their establishments meet all food safety related requirements all the time. It's simply never going to yeah. happen. It, it is. So it's so it's about it's, it's about developing um, a, 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 as much a, as much as possible a culture within the establishment that, for the most part, is following is following good food safety yeah. good food safety standard practices. I think that one of the biggest things that Daniel's identifying in inspections is that um, there's there's the law states that there's supposed to be one um, food safety manager in the establishment. And then that person then designates a person in charge. Um, so not everybody um, who you see food handling has gone through a serve safe certification class. But I think what Daniel's starting to identify is that there's a fairly consistent theme that um, there's not as much communication going on between the establishment's food safety manager uh, and the person that are designating as the person in charge at any given time. Um, so that's something that we want to we want to be working on again to, to start to get into create the culture. Of, um, of continuous food safety um, practices and establishments, regardless of whether or not their quote unquote food safety practice manager is on at, that any, at any given time. So, a sushi bar, that's okay for them to grab it with their hands? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't sure, it's not cooked. 
<laughs> no, 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 it's not. And what they they don't what they do is they actually the the um, they use these kind of bamboo wraps how they how they make the the, 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 the sushi. I know how they. Yeah, do. and they'll actually lace that with um, with uh, tin foil. Not, not tin foil, excuse me, saran wrap, plastic. And they, they also, since it's ready to eat food, although it's raw, but it's ready to eat, it's been frozen, and that's the nature of the food, um, they, they also have to adhere to those practices. And what I can tell you is, truthfully, I would say 99.99% .99 of the restaurants here have a supply of gloves. And when the health inspector comes in, everybody starts wearing gloves. Mm -hmm. But it's times like that where they forget or, they, or they're defiant. Many, many different things can happen. But they forget to put their gloves on and they contact food. And I still do see that. I, I, do, uh, I do cite people for that. There, there's, there's definitely... And you know what no, a good message is for, for, your, for your constituency is also, is that if, if, they have a, if they have a particular concern at a restaurant, I mean, they can always call us, but they can always say something at that given time. If they really, this happens sometimes, and I'm, I'm thankful for it when people call and complain, they say, so such so, so was doing this, and I called them out on it. I said, you know, at that moment in time, I said, shouldn't you be wearing gloves, or should you be handling money at the same time you're, or whatever. <coughs> I think it's good, and it also gives us a window into how the establishment is reacting um, to that issue. Because the person said is, well, okay, yes, they accepted it, or they challenged me on it. It gives us a window into how they're actually being. I know one of the health board members, she's not here anymore. She outright went to a restaurant. <coughs> she was so upset. She told them, put those gloves on. And she came back and she told me about it. And she told me exactly where it was occurring. And we, we did an inspection and... The individuals. The, the, I think it's the a different operator. case he's talking about, but oh, yeah. but food handlers. I mean, it, when when an inspection is taking place, and if that's what's seen, they they are written up, so to speak. Right. Do they're not in a, compliance. Do you give them a call and say I'm coming, oh, and no, you just walk no, in? No, no, no. There's no call. These the reinspections are often scheduled because there's there might be a reason to have a particular person oh. present. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, no, and our policy is to do an inspection based upon every complaint. So you fines involved? Fines? Or just to, or just to, or just to write about? Uh, we have we instituted a policy that's not a fine and it's not a fine per se, but we instituted a policy last year that um, establishments that are having the same problem over and over again will be put on a monthly inspection schedule, and then that carries a fee. Yeah. Um, and so we, and we've had we've had a couple of establishments <coughs> that have had to have gone through that um, through that problem, that process. So let's just, in the interest of time, I'm going to move, ask that we move things along a little bit. Um, you want to do what? Ask that we move things along a little bit from a little bit. the um, first the heading one. of the um, uh, looks like um, ten that you have there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to ask one thing. <laughs> Are the are the food inspections uh, the uh, the food inspection reports the documents that are created are they technically public records? Of course. Yes. Okay. So they then, are, everything there, is. but the the real question is whether you want to make them as accessible as a simple website, right? As simply clicking on a button on a website. Yes. So anybody possibly can not make them that accessible, but in the spirit of openness and transparency, there should be some method some sort of reporting method that people can see. Uh, so please, you know, work on some sort of grading system or something like that. I think that's the sort of the consensus. Right, from, because from the doctor that I was with on my ward highly suggested that I bring committee. that up about a website. Okay, thank you. So what you're and saying is uh, collectively a, a website that just has the findings, the inspectional findings, and the report right yeah, there. Well, maybe not. There's something there's that, there's something there's that there's some a ton of different models, and I've, yeah. I know I've, I've, I've looked at them a lot. I think that is something that we'll, we'll continue to, uh, to look at and think about for sure. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, also on food, this is a good, um, interesting byproduct of the recent storm. Uh, something that we're going we're gonna to take up soon and um, make part of um, uh, 
of our, our process with working with food establishments is to have, um, have them each develop good emergency action plans. Um, so in the case of these really widespread power outages, we have, um, we have a record basically of, of what every establishment says they're going to do um, in those types of instances and also have um, a, good, uh, a good way of contacting them. A while back when we first got the Connect CTY system in the city, I, I thought it would be a great idea to develop a, um, a restaurant user group for Connect CTY. And we started working on that, got lost in the shuffle, and it's something that we'll probably bring back up again and, um, and make something a little bit more useful. So that's going to be another initiative that we'll work on. So it's, if someone's planning to have a big party, that a lot of students. There you go. Get rid of the food before it goes bad. <laughs> that's the no comment. Okay. It sounds like a plan. <laughs> Is there a standard? I mean, will you have a standard for them, or you just work with them to figure out? You'll we'll have, have some standard. suggestions. We'll have a standard. I think actually what we'll do is just create a very easy to fill out template. Um, it's sort of thing where it'll be like, if the power has been out for um, less than two hours, this is what you're going to do. If the power has been out for more than four hours, this is what you're going to do. Those sorts of things. And have them posted in places and have numbers, phone numbers that they can contact. It's great. Um, not to say that I don't think our food establishments did a bad job whatsoever um, in the recent storm. I think actually it was, it was they were they all did a great job in, uh, in, making, in making decisions that were, were good for the public health. Um, the last little piece just for this, for this section is related to private wells and that the, the um, city has, has horrible raw records on private wells. We don't have very good records on, um, on subject systems either, but we have even worse records on private wells. We basically don't know anything about um, the, the, uh, the uh, water quality that comes from um, private drinking wells in the city. Um, and the only way that we know where private wells exist is just an, is an extrapolation of where the, um, the water mains end. So I've, uh, I've, I've, I've gotten a couple of interns um, from, from UMass and we're starting on a, a private well study, um, which essentially is going to start with um, um, getting all of the well completion reports that the state um, the State Department of Environmental Protection maintains. They've already given that to us. I'm looking at our hard copy records and, and doing a sort of a gap analysis, trying to figure out exactly where um, um, all the wells are in the city and work with the planning department's um, GIS coordinator to develop a, a real good definitive map of, um, of properties that have private well. And then I'm going to have these interns go out and do um, some, field, some field analysis and do some surveying of, of people with wells and um, ask if um, they do water quality testing on any regular basis. And, if so, if they'd be willing to share those water quality reports with us all, sort of in the, um, in the hopes that we can develop a good um, a bit of um, data and information that will help us um, figure out if there is any regulatory um, process that we should be going through or, or um, better permitting process for, um, um, that the city should be going through related to private well water. Tell them if they need any um, help on my ward for the reconstruction of Route 66 and the blasting. I know exactly where all the wells are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, ne the next section is uh, related to um, housing in place. I can't get my time's almost up. Um, so just just real quick here, housing continues to be a uh, just a um, a major. Um, um, uh, use of our, uh, of our staff resources. Uh, just a few things to highlight here. Hoarding seems to be a, a, an, an issue that is um, becoming more and more um, prevalent and, um, and maybe I guess I could say um, sort of diagnosed as an actual issue. And so we're participating um, in the Hampshire County Hoarding Task Force, which is providing us with good professional development already to this issue and good connections. We're lucky in our end that we have um, what's widely considered to be the national hoarding um, expert, Randy Frost, is a professor at Smith College, and he participates in our task force. He's a wealth of information, and he also does good research. Um, is this and a problem throughout the whole city, then? Because my ward is in one hoarding. The Prospect Street House. It's, a, it's, an, it's an issue in all pockets of the city, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, don't look at my house. <laughs> Hope we don't get a complaint yeah, going. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> I'm just going to jump down here to dumping issues because I know it's something that I talked with Marianne a little bit about. Uh, you know, the illegal dumping, um, I think, is probably going to be more and more of an issue 
Um, that's sort of how I'm reading things. And um, the city doesn't really have a great uh, model for dealing with illegal, with illegal dumping. So I'm uh, working with the DPW to um, develop, uh, develop some, and maybe the police department, developing uh, better uh, enforcement tools so that we can, uh, we can address those issues. Um, so that's, uh, that's going to be something that we're going to continue to work on over the next year. I'm going to uh, jump into the next, next piece here uh, related to uh, public health nursing and chemical disease. Uh, when, uh, um, right before uh, Claire left, we were having lots of discussions about um, uh, the possibility of developing a revolving fund um, for public health nursing um, related initiatives, initiatives and projects. And, at the end, um, she agreed to um, push this idea forward. And actually, I'm going to see both of you tomorrow at finance committee to be talking more in depth about this. Yeah. Um, but it's something that I hope that we can hope, hope that we can establish and and, um, and put into action. The, um, the 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 writing on the wall is that our our free uh, supply of, of state vaccine is going to continue to wither. Um, and um, we want to be able to more proactively um, uh, decide what, what is in the best interest of our community related to um, vaccine-preventable diseases. Um, so uh, the establishment of a fund like this would, would enable us to do that, and we've identified a new revenue source to fund the fund, um, which is to um, uh, actually start doing reimbursements for um, the cost of vaccine that we purchase and the administration of vaccine we actually giving people the shot. Um, and so this year, for the first time, um, we're, we're, we're starting to do that, and we became, um, um, we came, became Medicare provider. Um, and we're with, um, a, through a contract with uh, Commonwealth Medicine, which is part of the UMass Medical School, we're going to do um, third-party billing for private insurers, too, for all um, um, flu vaccines that we gave out this year, which are upwards of 600, by the way. Um, Trish Abbott did a fabulous do job. 600? Yeah. Where, um, where will the funding, where will it come from? <coughs> Uh, so it will come from reimbursement um, um, reimbursement from, from health insurers, from Medicare or private health insurance. Okay. Um, so for a state supplied vaccine, um, we can we can recoup some costs for the administration of that vaccine, actually giving the shot. Um, for a vaccine that we purchase, and every year we do purchase some vaccine, um, we can get um, we can get the reimbursed for the cost of the vaccine plus the administration. Of um, and it ends up being a you know not, it's not a huge pot of money in any way, shape, or form, but it's a it's it's enough to um, um, think about being able to um, identify the vaccine preventable diseases that we want to focus on, buy the vaccine for those particular have purposes, it. have it, and be able to um, on a yearly basis identify what those what those issues are and proactively be able to address them in the city. Okay, so maybe buddy, uh, East Coast Billing could that, that be in conjunction with the um, uh, fire department? Uh, ambulance billing, uh, possibly, yeah. Right for the, I think for this first year, this uh, this this fall as a test, we're doing our own Medicare billing. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a huge number. So the clerk said she was fine with with with, with coordinating and all that. So she'll put in, she'll do the roster billing for Medicare. So, uh, do you, do you but for the private, we, 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 we send off to Commonwealth um, Commonwealth Medicine. Okay, but do you have the expertise in your office to do that billing? Mm -hmm. Is there? We're going to find out. Okay, I'm and just curious. Yeah. You know. I, um, because if you pay three and a half or four percent to East Coast billing, it might be worth it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it will in the long term. I think just for the, the for this first phase, we just want to do it ourselves, see see what the process is, and um, and uh, then we'll figure things out okay. in the future. But it's a new revenue source. Yeah, not a revenue source of the city. So, um, so, so that, that, that's a reimbursement like a year, year and a half down the line. You never get that right away. Uh, Medicaid, I think Medicare I think, is usually about a year. I think the private insurers are faster. Okay. I think the private insurers actually are a lot faster, yeah. and the, the, the turnaround time for actually submitting the um, submitting the forms for reimbursement for the private insurers is 30 days. Medicare, you get about six months or something like that. <coughs> Don't quote me on those numbers. Well, well, say like what CVS, Walmart, you see them advertising flu shots. Are those RNs that get them, or? Yes, most likely. Yeah. Uh, pharmacists, I think, are technically allowed to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, pharmacists, LPNs, RNs. Yeah. Yeah. So it could be a pharmacist, but most likely they've got them. They have um, the other little piece, this is, this is going to be a, a fun thing for us to, uh, to work on, something that the community will see sometime, hopefully in the not-too-distant future, with, uh, with the, um, the, the Emergency Preparedness Coalition that we're part of in Hampshire County. We used um, some of our 
remaining funds that were rolled over from dealing with the H1N1 um, uh, issue to purchase a, a, a trailer that was retrofitted into a, a mobile vaccine clinic. Um, and I think it's going to be housed here in Northampton. We're still sort of working out those details, but um, it's here. It's actually sitting in East Hampton right now. Uh, and it's uh, kind of it's just needs its lettering and it's ready to go. Um, and so we're really excited about that. It's going to be a fun way to get out into the community and, and um, do, some, uh, do some health education related work and, um, and do mobile um, vaccine clinics. So hopefully, if not this year, it's getting maybe a little bit late, although it does have heat. <laughs> um, now, we'll, where we'll is get, that? We'll get from? rolling. The Who money. That? The, the, our, the, prepared, the, Hampton, the Emergency Preparedness Coalition that Northampton is part of purchased it. And how much money was left over in, in that H1N1? Um, I don't know those those exact those exact numbers. No, I don't know them. I mean, for the city or for well, not a thousand, or for the for the coalition as a whole. The coalition as a whole. Uh, we spent it all, so yeah. I, I don't know what, what you mean uh, in terms of leftover from actually. Well, you purchased the trailer with rollover funds. Oh yeah, there was probably over a hundred thousand dollars left as a as as a as a whole countywide um, that was rolled over after actually dealing with H one N one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and a lot of things were done with that, with that money. Yeah. This was a, this is a piece that I can't remember the exact cost of the trailer, but it was probably around twenty thousand dollars. Okay, thank you. Um, so, related to uh, just some some um, some projects and, and uh, initiatives we're working on related to um, community health and, and chronic disease, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. One really um, nice uh, thing happened very recently. We've been working over the past year or so with farmers markets to. Um, increase their accessibility to um, all members of the community. And one organization in particular that we've been working with to do that is this great um, organization that is housed at Jackson Street School called Families with Power. And uh, they are um, they're an organization that works with low income and um, um, people of color to uh, just be more empowered to be, to be members and um, proactive members of the school community and community at large. And um, we worked really hard with them around um, issues around access to healthy food, and they were just recognized for that work um, by this statewide organization called the Massachusetts Public Health Association. I think doing great. And last Friday, we went to the award ceremony, America ceremony for that. So that was a really nice... Uh, How long have you been around Families of Power? It's a pretty new organization. About uh, maybe three years, two, yeah. three years. <coughs> Not that long. Mary Cowie is a teacher at Jackson Street who is the um, sort of lead faculty liaison organizer who is uh, Mary who? Mary Cowie, C-O-W-H-E-Y. Really wonderful advocate yeah. in the community. Um, so that's a, that's a, that was a really nice um, recognition. Um, and just real quickly, we we're, we're, have a whole bunch of school-based initiatives going on um, related to the whole issue of access to healthy food, and we're going to continue sort of to work on those. I, I wanted to quickly tell you that we are um, receiving um, funds from the State Department of Public Health to become a mass in motion community. We learned that fairly recently, and that's going to be a collaborative effort with Amherst, Belcher Town, and Williamsburg. Um, and uh, th the focus of those funds are to um, look at policy-related solutions to the issues, um, issues related to chronic disease, most, most, mostly focused on issues related to access to healthy food and, and um, um, <coughs> excuse me, active living, so, you know, exercise, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, so we're, we're going to be getting those funds in um, the first part of 2012 and starting to work on uh, work on those initiatives, which is great. It's nice to have a little bit. It's not a huge amount of money, but it's a nice little pot of money to um, to continue to have um, somebody available to focus in on the support of chronic disease related issues. Um, and asthma, asthma is and continues to be a uh, a real area of concern for me and um, an area that I think that we need to sort of step up to the plate and, and as a community deal with a little bit more uh, strongly and. Uh, and better, and, and we've been in conversation with the Pioneer Valley Asthma Coalition, which is very heavily focused on Springfield, uh, about bringing up their resources and, and knowledge and trying to start a chapter of that in Northampton and go through this, a similar process that they've gone through in terms of identifying um, the types of um, issues that lead to, uh, lead to asthma, especially childhood asthma. Um, so looking at primarily indoor air quality related issues in the home environment, in the school environment, in the work environment, and um, developing the, you know, the necessary coalitions and, and networks to be able to identify and, and work on those and work on those issues. That's great. And so the Montana Power Plant, that's a fine example of clean coal technology. 
I, don't, I actually don't know very much about that. You say that with a smile on your face, so where are you going with that, Gene? <laughs> One of the worst in the nation. Right. One of the worst in the nation. I do know that there were some, uh, some protests recently about, about the, the, coal, the coal plant. The Pioneer Valley in general is bad air quality. Yeah, it's got bad air quality. I know, Ben, when we had some serious problems with the odor issues, issues coming out of the landfill, I had a doctor who dealt specifically with children with upper respiratory problems and with the asthma, and he spoke elegantly about the odors from that landfill and affecting children. <coughs> but we haven't had any odor problems like on the class so far. <laughs> so just uh, real quick, I can uh, just give you some, some brief updates on, on some of the major things that the Board of Health in particular has, okay. been, has been focused on. So. Um, uh, when I spoke to you last, we were in the, I think, the final phases of, of working on the new recycling regs. Um, and they, but those were adopted um, since I was here, and they went into effect the first of, um, of, of this year, January 1st, 2011. And I think uh, 2012 is all going to be about enforcement of those things. Uh, and so we'll be working with Karen McQuill and the DPW to um, develop a good, uh, good way of making sure that those regulations are um, are actually in effect and have an impact. Um, the board helped did a lot of work related to um, this whole issue of, of bears, which you know I say with a smile on my face all the time, but it's actually a real significant issue. It is. um, and uh, so the board of health developed um, some model regulations um, for dealing with the issue of feeding wildlife, and um, made the decision that they would recommend that it would be a citywide ordinance rather than a more sort of isolated board of health regulation <coughs> in action. Um, and so we're at the phase of working with the city solicitor to develop some model ordinance language based upon the recommendations of the Board of Health, and that will be coming before the city council, hopefully sometime hey, relatively soon. We need it. I actually have a whole package on that from the uh, State Department of Environment for Bears. And, uh, matter of fact, um, Angela Plasman's husband, who's an environmental officer, was <laughs> working on an ordinance, him, and, um, and his environmental police. Um, I actually have all that stuff if you want it. Sure. It might be. Uh, I, we've been working with we've been working with DEP too. Okay. So it might be not DEP. Vision of uh, Fish yeah, and Wildlife. Fish and Wildlife. Right. Yeah. We have um, them at JFK, and they did a whole seminar. Yeah. About what to do and not to do. Mm, yeah, that's great. Because we actually had a resident, uh, Lady Silver Lane, who was feeding the baby cubs and the mother by hand. Yes, it happens. It happens. It really does. And so we, we in, the city needs the city needs something that. Um, Will, will be more than will you please stop doing that? Exactly. And that, that's the that's the basic focus of, of the ordinance. I think that's great. Um, Northampton, it's it's amazing. Northampton is a it's just a perfect perfect community for um, for bears. It's, sure it's got is. enough natural habitat, but enough urban and suburban um, features to um, create those uh, constant food sources. We have, visits, yard every night. we have visits three okay. times a day in our backyard. Mm -hmm. Maple Street in Florence. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's yeah. pretty much. <laughs> <Bar -age laughs> um, the board has been working a lot on sort of the, the what I kind of consider to be the last frontier of, um, of, of smoking-related um, um, policies and, and regulations, which is to look at the issue of smoking um, in multi-unit um, dwellings and the effects of secondhand smoke in multi-unit. Um, and we've been looking at that issue both from the um, public housing side and the private market side. Now, when you're saying smoking, are you also including marijuana and all that when you're saying smoking? We are not. We are not. I mean, ma marijuana, it, that's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a substance that is regulated and, and, um, by, by law enforcement and, and not by, um, uh, not by, and uh, so we focus on we focus on the secondhand secondhand effects of um, of tobacco smoke. Um, so that we've got a couple of we've been working with the public housing authority and just trying to um, uh, provide them with information. We had, we had an intern who did a survey there just to try and gauge whether or not there would be um, an uproar if the housing authority decided to start moving towards smoke-free housing units. Um, and so we're sort of in the process of, of working with the housing authority as they think about those issues. And on the private market side, um, what the Board of Health is interested in doing is um, developing a, a regulation that would be a smoking disclosure regulation. And uh, the intent of that would be not to say that, that a property owner 
um, has to have a smoke-free unit or, or not have not. Um, the intent is to have a disclosure to say you have a policy, and that policy is all my units are, you know, all, everybody in all my units can smoke, or all my units are smoke-free, or these units are smoke-free, these units aren't. And to make that policy known and available to future and current um, lessees. So that's a, so that's a, um, that's a regulation that's probably in the works at some point in the, in the calendar year 2012. Right. We would also look at uh, smoking in, in uh, bus stop, uh, the bus stop. Uh, the shelters. Uh, shelters. Yes, we can. Uh, the problem with that, Owen, is that it's, it's, the enforcement is, we can certainly do it. I just, uh, I, I just caution uh, um, that when it comes to enforcement, it's really difficult. And we've had some of those conversations with, with, the, with, the, um, with PBTA about who actually is responsible. Because um, that's, that's sort of the key when it comes down to enforcement, is finding a responsible party. Um, and so it's, uh, it's uh, from an enforcement angle, that's really difficult. How about like signage or something? But signage is certainly possible. Well, just saying, if you're considering some of this, it might be, if you're doing the last mile, it might be, yeah. I don't want to put that like in. Even Enforcement may be something later down the line, but yes. yeah, for sure. Because he's just, right just about to that. Just to consider. No, it's, you're 100% right. You find it difficult, even the noise ordinance has been impossible to enforce. I mean, absolutely impossible. And we spent, we started out with a noise ordinance that was, I think it was three lines. Is this about the truck? No, no <coughs> before that, before that was a noise ordinance. It started off to be three lines. It was a small paragraph. By the time we got through, it was a hundred and seven or eight pages. Well, that's because of the quarry and the lawsuits that were. And it got to not be the enormous. quarry, but the gravel pit. There yeah. was a lawsuit about that. And never, and there was never a violation. It was never a fine. Never well, they went down there. The building inspectors did go down. They used the um, decimal decimal meters. Meters. meters, right? I wonder, now you're talking about smoking inside of yes. the apartment, or are you talking about banning smoking on the property? Well, sort of all of the above. Um, so the smoking disclosure, just to clarify, wouldn't ban anything. It would require that the, the property owner develop a policy. And that policy could be you can smoke everywhere, or that policy could be um, can smoke nowhere. you can smoke nowhere, or it could be everything, sort of anything in between, uh, some sort of a they could not even smoke in their own apartment or their condo. Well, that's well. There's lots of there are lots of um, rental units in Northampton that are that smoke are free. all smoke free, and that's yeah. the, that's the private property. That's the property owners. That's the property owners' right to include in a lease that a unit is is smoke free. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I know Louise Jeffway has smoke free units. It's mm -hmm. All smoke free units. Yes, a lot. But a lot if you're going to smoke, you have to go outside. Right. A lot of property owners do. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's other. Landlords that don't let you smoke on the property at all. Right. I can right. say going outside, but yeah. to tell people what to yep. do in their own place, I have a problem with. <coughs> okay. So you know, I think next year uh, we'll we'll continue to we'll we'll be looking at the issue of private wells. I'm pretty sure. Um, and then um, I think there'll be a lot of chronic disease related policies that will be there'll be a sort of focus to the board of health. And I also anticipate that solid waste continues to be uh, will be continue to be an area that the board of health will have to focus on. So that's it. I thank you thank both you. for being here. We'll hopefully see you next year. And you want to wish a happy holiday. Yes, happy thank holidays. you. All of you too. Nice to meet you. Thank you. I thank you. Pass up as opposed to hack up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Take care. Huh? All right. We'll see you. Thank All you. Right. Carol, come forward. Huh? Thank you. We well, hello there, Carol. Right? How are you? He's already here. <laughs> How's it going? I don't think we've had a chance to do it. Oh, wait. And you know Counselor Tennessee. Oh, yes. yes, indeed. How are you? <laughs> Very well. Good. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Carol. So, we're gonna, Emily, we're gonna go how are you planning to do a movie or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm recording for Nursery Kids. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we let we're Emily go on first? Red oh, she's coming. Let her talk first. That's fine. Uh oh. Would you like to do that? No. <laughs> I guess I'm going to wait. She wants to wait and let us give the. I have some. Um, you, I think you got copies of a report that I sent yes, out in I advance. Is an extra copy, and then I have a, a set or two for the minutes. If you have.
out. If I don't, don't mind, I'll have Emily have one to look at while we're doing this. I know you have copies of this, but, um, and a few extra brochures here. So, um, I think we have some choices. It sounds like the idea might be to take a, a look through our report and see if you have questions about that or the other materials that I've given you. Um, and, um, and then maybe ask Emily to say some things from a youth perspective and, um, and get your advice for, for future efforts and suggestions and additional commissioners. Oh, Carol, where do you get your money? We don't get any. You don't get any else. So you're just strictly <laughs> running by volunteers. We do run you run don't buy volunteers. There was some fundraising that was done before my time. Um, and uh, so we have a little pot of money that we actually plan to use on December 1st to buy some lunch for people for the day that we're yep. mm -hmm. introducing to people or expanding conversation. And so what are you, who pays to? Well, I actually together. paid for those. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's a contribution. Yep. Um, one of our former uh, commissioners, Mia, uh, has uh, offered to uh, to make a contribution and pay for a, a large number of them. Otherwise, we do them in a less classy way mm -hmm. on the equipment that's in City Hall, and Corinne is always gracious about making copies for it. And so if you were to make a contribution to the Human Rights Co Commission? Yes. Or coalition, or what is it? Co commission. Commission. Uh -huh. How would you go about doing that? You would send it to the mayor's office, and there's a line item that they would put the money in. So it would be a, a gift to the city of Northampton designated for the Human Rights Commission. So if I could come right into the button, the general fund, and then it is? It's a line item mm -hmm. that is for the Human Rights Thank you. Commission. And it goes right into our general fund? Mm-hmm. Well, as that's my understanding at this point. We, you know, I mean, I'm not kidding when I say we yeah. sort of look around the room and say, anybody willing to throw in mm -hmm. money? And I'm sort of thinking. morally against it, but I, you know. <laughs> and and I was wondering if you ever did any fundraising or anything. That has been some discussion that we've had, uh, that we I think would like to do that. Would do well on that. Right. And I think that we can do that. Um, we uh, have... Uh, not put that at the top of our activity list, but absolutely there's no reason why we shouldn't. Yeah. So I, we actually feel like this event on the 1st is kind of a, um, a different scale of coming out within the city, if you will. So kind of in the step, the direction of outreach that we have been talking about. It just seems kind of cumbersome to put it into that and then have you get it out somehow. Yeah. Yeah, how do you get it out? Oh, we just we just let the mayor's office know. Um, in fact, what's interesting about this event on the first, which is my first experience drawing on our income, um, it's been used to make a banner, I think, in the past. But, yep. You know, um, and it's it's really quite simple. I'm just telling Corrine Philippides, we need you know we need this money. And in this instance, in fact, she has said, oh, this is such a fabulous idea. I think I can get some contributions from a couple of other sources and you yep. know so she's the she's our our, our staff person and the, and when the commission was formed it was uh, founded and the the direction was great but it's a citizens commission and don't expect there to be a part of the budget allocation for this commission's activities mm -hmm. We can find some type of parking ticket that they write somewhere along the line that we can <laughs> flip over. Like we, we did. We had to do it for. <laughs> look what we did. We did it for the right? Commission on Disabilities. We researched for the Committee on Disabilities. They have no money. Now they're having money. Wow, mm -hmm. that's kind of exciting. There's some, you know, there certainly are things that we we duplicate out of the office. Um, I, it's time for us to again, which we will for this event, but it's time for us to get packets. We've had packets hanging in the library and the police station and so on that have the complaint forms for people and our brochure mm -hmm. and information. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that we do. It's been
together is your office? Well, um, we um, meet in the meeting room in yep. the city hall. There is no office in the hair on the in the city. You know, again, it's strictly a volunteer citizens group. Yep. So um, we work out of our homes. We are yep. uh, sensitive about the way we communicate via email uh, in accordance with the training that we've had about open meeting law. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so we've stopped uh, jointly group writing our things like um, op-ed pieces. Yep. We used to sort of <coughs> work together on email, and now we follow the rules. We mm -hmm. figure since we don't make financial decisions, we're probably not so likely to be worried about, but we're careful about the rules. So your records, your, your records, where do you keep, where are your records? Our, uh, the, the records on file for, say, the uh, minutes, mm -hmm. et cetera, are in the mayor's office. Okay. That's where that's handled, is out of that office. And uh, more and more online now. Yeah. Okay. So the, um, all minutes are posted online, mm -hmm. et cetera. All agendas, you know, open meeting law. And when was this commission formed? When was this? 1998 was. Uh, Marjorie Hess was among those. Was oh, it is. Not. I'm sorry. Here it is right here. You yeah. Look at it. But it was, <coughs> Marjorie it Hess and Michael Sparkling wrote something. Yep. Marjorie <laughs> Hess and Michael Sparkling wrote something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've been working for a good while, and some of the same folks are, you know, Marjorie has been really oh, yeah. no longer on the commission, but she's one of our best supporters. Yep. There certainly are others who have given chunks of time. Heather Johnson was a devoted leader for the Human Rights Commission. What was your budget last year? Do you have any idea <coughs> no, how much money? I, mean, I don't know how much was spent on paper, but that would be the budget. That's all. Postage? Office supplies of postage? Very little postage because, um, for example, if somebody files a complaint, they bring it into the mayor's office. So there might be a tiny bit of postage of responding in a letter from time to time. But again, we're citizens, we just absorb that. Unless it goes in and out of the mayor's office. And whether the mayor's office keeps a separate account of what they spend for a, a mailing for yep. mm -hmm. a complaint letter, I don't know that. I was just Thanks. curious because with the Committee on Disabilities, their funding, yep. they only can allocate so much yeah. within so many years. Huh. Okay. This will poke at it a little bit. Yeah. Yes, sir. If um, a citizen has reason to believe that they were, their uh, rights were violated during when in contact with the public safety or the police, right. would they, what would they, why would they use the Human Rights Commission, and should they, and is the Human Rights Commission, I mean, I, I see what, what happened here as a particular right. issue, but I mean, what are, what are their options? You know, we're a listening group and a, a resource group. We're, we have obviously no adjudicatory power whatsoever. Um, so in a way, we're a, a kind, as I see it, a kind of, where complaints are concerned, of a form of safety valve and respect on the part of the city. So s someone may come with a complaint because they suspect they've been ill handled. And we're a place where they can say they feel they've been ill handled. We may, we may say, you know, you, if you can take, anyone is free to take anything that they feel is discrimination to the Mass Commission Against Discrimination. The truth of the matter is that it's extremely hard to pass the, the, um, the uh, barriers that are there, or the guidelines, for being uh, supported through a, re a hearing through the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination. So one of the things we can say is you're very welcome to file but we have the feeling that you may have difficulty getting a hearing through that resource. Let's talk about what else is possible. And what else and is possible? 
it may be if it's a housing situation, you ask about police, and we might ask about that in a minute, but in a housing situation, we would refer people to questions around the housing support system, the social network that's here in the city. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, it may be um, that, that they've gone that route, and we're just hearing and saying, you know, there's really not a lot else we can suggest to you, but you may want to talk um, again to someone that we know is a supportive ear. So you can see that a lot of what we're doing is lending support. We aren't solving problems if they can't be solved. Um, now where police is concerned, we have, we, we understand that with, that with a housing agency, if somebody says I'm discriminated by a housing agency, if I feel I've been unfairly treated by the police, then the role that we play is to send a letter to them or to the YMCA or whatever it is and say a complaint has been filed. We welcome you to give a response back. Um, if you um, are willing to and, and, the, and the complainant wishes for that, we're certainly willing to sit with the two parties to talk with each other if there's any way that by providing that kind of a, a setting there may be some way of understanding. What it does is it gives the police, let's say, an opportunity to say, well, A, we hold things in confidence, so there are numbers of things we won't be saying, but let us give you the perspective, and we, this is what we've done. And so in a way, they are, in that, to that extent, accountable to somebody in the, in the commission, to the commission in the city. By being, a, by being expected to explain their policies and practices. So um, what we have found is that we've had uh, Chief Sinkiewicz has come to us more than once um, to talk about something that's been um, presented as a concern. Some of that time that's been a reassurance of how they practice um, and information about the steps taken. Other times he'll quite proudly tell you that some, some um, shifts have been made in the way the police department will report or will make clear how their handling is, for example, around some immigrant issues, around stops of people and communicating with people, being sure that there are uh, items of uh, in foreign languages, particularly in Spanish. So it's a conversation, really, that we're able to inspire and incorporate. So we, you know, in another case we went and sat with the um, board of trustees and the executive director of an agency. So there had been more than one complaint. And we just said, you know what, we, we're getting these complaints. It seems like maybe there's something we need to at least understand more clearly so that we, you know, know what, what to say if people raise concerns and how to work with them. And who are the state or federal agencies that people would complain to? As a state agency? Yeah. It's the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination. So the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination exists to give support to, to um, really, um, it's like a civil adjudicatory board that could hear someone's complaint in a protected group. So it's the, the uh, the protected groups are veterans, um, age is protected, mm -hmm. um, gender, disabilities, and I think we're almost there on transgender, and that was something that we talked with the city council about a while ago. So that means that if you, if I'm over 40, a couple of years, if I say that I've been discriminated against on the basis of my age, and can present a clear enough case with evidence that meets their guidelines for justifying that, then they would go into a hearing process. And, and if you were my employer and I brought a strong case that indicated that you had discriminated against me on the basis of my age, then they have the power to say, there's a fine, you must pay me my back wages, um, you must conduct um, uh, training, etc. So that those kinds of things are the kinds of things that have been taken up against fire departments uh, across the state, 
employers, etc. But you say that bar is set pretty high for you to reach. It is. For example, we've had we had someone who came who said, "I've been discriminated against terribly as a transgendered person," um, and I and I'm pretty sure it's 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 gender. And we said, "Well, we you know we we welcome you to test that out." But when we've tested that out on behalf of people, we've heard the following statement. You know, the policies are such, mm -hmm. the way they're written are such, <laughs> and what they're asking for is not easily evidenced and shown. So, I mean, uh, uh, sort of from my years of experience, I've known a lot of people who have had what looked like really legitimate concerns, not here in this community, who have still had not been able to make it through, and it's an underfunded agency, so, you know, so it's a long process. Is there a federal also? There is a federal, yes, there are, is a federal, but, um, I'm trying to think of the exact name of it. Do you remember by any chance in your study of, um, it's a, but it is a federal agency, so that, uh, so that, for example, if there's an organization that's getting federal funding, that's where you would take that kind of complaint. And that's what, well, Governor Patrick worked for the federal agency before oh, becoming a um, candidate for governor and various other things. But, you know, so high-level high legal staff is working at the federal level. Looking and going through your report, right and how you have worked very closely with Social Services and Veterans yeah. Affairs and with City Council. If you look at all the endorsements that has been made through our City Council, it's unbelievable. Well, it's very exciting. Of course, it's thrilling to work with a City Council that wants to have that kind of a resource. Mm -hmm. You know, it's absolutely thrilling. <coughs> um, because it is, you know, we, we listen carefully. We don't put forward um, proposals if we feel like, as we've talked it over, yeah, no, not so sure that's a human rights issue <laughs> that we would support, or there may be, you know, but we get into some very interesting um, uh, uh, considerations, and one of the very interesting ones that was before 2010, 2011, was the concern about um, uh, the uh, genocide of Armenians, and we were in a debate about how we were going to, you know, what we would bring and how we would handle that. So sometimes we have to work pretty hard. <laughs> Let me Can we possibly hear what Emily has to say about oh, our youth? Sure. Mm -hmm. Emily is our newest, um, yes, maybe not our newest commissioner, but certainly our youngest. And has she a was our youngest. Ideas about evaluation. the future for. Um, human rights work, and so just to say some things you're thinking about. Uh, well, I'd like to go over a few things that uh, the commission has done so far this year that I think were really great. Um, one is just the panel discussion for veterans that we co-sponsored at the World War II Club. I know that's, I know you were there, I'm not sure about everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that was really great because if you were looking at the audience, it had such a great age range. You had students there from the high school, and you had people there that could remember Vietnam. So uh, I think that was a really good thing to have in our community because we hear a lot of uh, anti-war protesters, which I think is good, but we don't always hear from veterans. We don't hear from people that have actually experienced war. And uh, having that, having that discussion, hearing those people's real experiences uh, for the whole community, I think was an eye-opening experience for everybody and myself. Um, the other thing um, that I've been working on personally is the Preserving Our Civil Rights Campaign, and that uh, addresses, first it addressed uh, things with immigration, uh, resolution opting out of secure communities, which was a really great measure. Uh, then it's moving on to focus on things like how racial information is collected by police officers, uh, trying to update that system to the state standards because it right now has been, it only consists of three categories of Caucasian, African-American, and Asian. So there are a few missing. <laughs> yes. 
And then also just looking at domestic surveillance, um, which is a, another complicated issue. But I think it's really important when you look. I went to this um, planning, uh, actually, meeting today at my Holyoke Community College and seeing how this region is growing with um, Hispanics and Latinos. It just keeps going up every year. And so that we're getting more diverse, and we need to make sure that those people are being treated um, equally and fairly, and that it's a great way to do it. Um, and then also looking forward, uh, the Human Rights Commission has decided that I will be working with the Youth Commission um, this upcoming year to look at uh, bullying issues at the school. Um, first, we're just going to evaluate it and see, you know, possible ways of doing maybe a survey, something like that, to see what is actually going on because, and also contacting the um, DA's office, seeing the type of things they do already, um, and then the principals, faculty members, seeing what kind of trainings they get, things like that. That's great. And I know in the DA's office with Dave Sullivan, um, Mary Carey is doing the outreach programs, and she's excellent. Mary Carey is yep. an outreach on the youth. On the community. Uh, with the community. Mary Carey, yep. yeah. Um, just back to the, the money part yeah. one time. What would you use the funds for? It seemed like you've gotten along without funds. Mm -hmm. Well, I think probably, I'm kind of blue skying yep. here in a sense because yep. it's not the, not the way we function. But I think we would use them for um, more um, sponsored events, yeah. you know, and more um, outreach in that way. So that I think we would probably use them to do some uh, some marketing, if you will, to let people know. Now, uh, explain to me just a, a, a naked example of, of a sponsored event. Well, uh, we certainly co-sponsored the event that we did at the World War II Club. Yeah. And so if, if, we, if we had budget for something like that, we, we, we might co-sponsor something with the Youth Commission mm -hmm. that would bring in an event and be able to provide some food. We, we've done some things like yeah. that before, but at the time, one of our commissioners provided the food for okay. this. Yep. <laughs> you know, Carol, probably wouldn't hurt to talk with Councilor Paul Spector. Um, I think he's on that committee no, the on youth. the youth commission and mm -hmm. talk with him. Have you been in touch with him? Already? I have been in touch with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much, I know he's he's not like technically on it. I think he just helps. No, kind of I know he does. Oversight. Yeah, I don't know how much he actually is. But I know he would help out. Yeah. I know yeah. somehow he's involved in some capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Probably, probably the youth commission. He is the city councilor. He has right. a daughter on it. On the youth commission? Or used to. I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing that I would see us doing, yeah. possibly acquiring some materials. For example, it, we might be able to, with a nice budget, be able to bring in a, a film or a speaker to, who would be um, able to address, we have so many people, but to be able to pay an honorarium to someone who could speak about an issue would be very different than just kind of always yep. asking. When we, we went to one of the copy places in town and asked if they would care to, to uh, give us a gift, and they said, hey, wait a minute, we pay taxes, why would we be photocopying for you too? And we go, mm -hmm. fair <laughs> enough. Uh, I think, you know, so those are the kinds yep. of things that I think that we use. I'd be curious to know how much you actually have in the mayor's office. I probably, I, you know, I, I have it written down because we just talked about it, but it's on an email exchange, so I can't tell you offhand. But it's like, you know, it's 80 bucks. Oh, yeah. 120, maybe. Okay. So give us your... I advice. think this is excellent. <laughs> We've got, um, uh, you know, we use... Uh, Do you have a labor lawyer who sits on... Uh, that you try to reach out as one of your commissioners? We have tried in the past. We don't have a lawyer at the moment. At one time, Wendy Burke was yeah. on, uh, and, and uh, Mia Sullivan was also. So we're, we're down a lawyer at the moment. And that's exactly one of the things I want to ask you about is, do you have in mind um, 
anybody who comes to mind who would be interested in being part of the commission. We have open spots at the moment. How many? We have about three or four open spots. I actually know uh, three people actually approached me rather recently about Good. joining the commission. So, uh, Jeff Napolitano uh -huh. uh, from Springfield, and we can have two commissioners from out of town. VJ... Bouchard? Yes. Does he live in town? Yeah. Okay. And then somebody else. Sorry. So what the process is, Bill, Bill Newman should be able to help you out well, finding an right. attorney. I was talking with Bill the other day, and I was thinking about asking him. So you be, have seats. We have seats. Three yes. or four. Yes, we have a total. We have the charter at the moment says we can have nine. And how many do you have now? We've got about six right now. Um, and we so just three. we just lost uh, Rich. I think he's listed as the advisory board. So we've got three. Um, and we are, we can quite easily re-propose that charter to enlarge that commission. I think it should. And we would like to do that. What has happened is that people complete, a, you know, an application, indicate that they're interested. That goes into the mayor's office, and it is an appointment. Yes, it goes to the mayor's office, and then it comes to city that's council right. to go to that's appointments right. and evaluations. Then we agree. then make a recommendation right to full city council. Does that to happen? Is that the standard form? That's yes. the standard form, and it's downloadable uh, from the, the website as well, but it's in the mayor's office, and we'll be spreading them around uh, at, at the luncheon on the 1st. And then just so that you kind of have a sense of it, I, I really only have one copy of the English and one of the Spanish in my packet, but the complaint form is in English and Spanish, mm -hmm. and the process for handling complaints. We, we don't get a lot of complaints. You might, we might have more, but we don't want to see ourselves as only complaint people. Right. Yeah. You know, so. So thoughts about um, thoughts of your advice about people who'd be good um, on this commission that would represent we could use we could use a voice from the disability co uh, disabled community as well and the veteran community and the veteran at the moment we do not have anyone who's a veteran um, and you know so so obviously the the protected classes. Uh, we have a couple of folks now who are... The veterans. Yeah. Why don't you give Tommy Peace a call? He's the one that just did the tribute tour yeah. and we worked very closely with him with yeah. our committee. And just tell him I told you to call him, Carol. And that maybe he would be able to find a veteran for you who would be involved. That would be great. Yeah. We're having the Committee on Disabilities this month. I'll talk to you. Pat Shaughnessy about it to great. see if they could find one of the members who might want to join. We'll certainly talk with her about you know being sure that we're a voice of support for any kinds of concerns. Right. Um, I, think I was going to ask you about whether uh, veteran recruitment's concern. We just talked about that, Carol, bringing in you uh, know the Human Rights Commission to the Committee on Disabilities. To talk to about. talk about. Yeah. Well, that's where I am. What I, you know, are there some people that you think you would that we ought to invite to hear what our spiel is on December first? A representative, say, of the veterans community, a rep who who would likely meet people who are um, who would want to know about the existence of the Human Rights Commission and the resources. Somebody in the veterans community. Somebody from maybe Pat Shaughnessy or something ought to be invited. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Um, that would be for what, December? It's December 1st. Yeah. When we're just really inviting people to lunch to just be able yeah. to okay. learn materials about yeah. what we're doing. Who's invited? You. Um, uh, the, all the city councilors, <laughs> all the city councilors, the mayor, and then all of the people that, who are in the um, social uh, agencies in the city and all of the people who've applied for um, the black grants. Yep. Okay. And I actually use that list to do a recruitment. So if you think of people that come to mind that would be just helpful for me to just say, hey, how about considering this? We'd love to talk with you. You don't have to fill out all the pink sheets of application, but we are all of us very willing to talk yep. about what we do.
Michael Nagy is the chair of the Committee on Disabilities. So I'm, I'm just asking that maybe possibly when you invite Pat Shaughnessy that he's included on it. Okay. All right. I'll go check those. If you ask Pat, she'll get a hold of them for right. you. Mm -hmm. N-A-G-Y. Mike Nagy. N-A-G-Y. N-A-G-Y, yep. Gave him an extra G. Um, is it, do you use it with anybody in the Veterans Affairs? I think the Mel. Have, like, Tom Pease is in there. Tom, and in, Tom in the Veterans Council. Who's the president? Jerry Clark, isn't it? Yeah, he does the Elks also. Yeah. I would go through Tommy Pease because yeah. he will definitely he'll be your best find, guy. Okay. He'll find somebody okay. yeah. through the council. Great. Right. Okay. Don't want to waste your time forever. He works all day long at the 1812 Autobody. Yeah. That's he right. owns it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I know how to find him. Back. Probably brought him many dents and screws. We want to thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you again. For everything and we'll do. see you again next year. And if you need any kind of help, please call. We do. <laughs> As you know. We'll look into that. But if you get we'll into, into the fundraising, I'll be glad to help you. That's great. Carol, if you get into the fundraising, I'll be glad to help you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have happy holidays. And you as well. Thanks. Yeah, gobble gobble. <laughs> I'm waiting for that day. <laughs> Can you tell? I'm wasting your way to nothing over here. Are you going home? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I'll see you later. Bye. How's it going? Good. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. I'd like um, to introduce um, Counselor from Ward 3, Owen Daniels Freeman, Hi. and Counselor Eugene Casey, and you know me. Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. I appreciate EJ being Thank here, you. and Danielle, you Thank also. Thank you for inviting us. Owen um, Daniels is a brand new counselor, and I would really like him to know about the functionings of the shelters, like Grove Street Inn, over here at the Station, yeah. and do a site visit if you'd like. And do what? Say that again. Yeah, I'd like to have him do a site visit. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't have any business cards with me, but we can set that up. Because right. we've been, I've been at it all the yeah, time. Yeah, you both. Budget cuts, no business cards. <laughs> <laughs> well, people still know so how to find it. You probably could leave your number after for Owen, yeah. so okay. he could make an appointment sure. and do Well, there are phone numbers on this. Are there? Yeah, the 586 okay. Reach me and we'll Okay, so, you know, we thought that, um, you know, Danielle, give a program description of, you know, because we, at this point we have two shelters that are currently running, the, um, the Interface Shelter, which is on Center Street, and uh, of course the Grove Street, which is year-round. The Interfaith is a, a six-month shelter, mm -hmm. or a four shelter, but I'll let, you know, Danielle describe her programs. So I'll start with the Interfaith Shelter, because one thing, the, as of tonight, the Interfaith Park Shelter, Interfaith Winter Shelter, in conjunction with the Friends of Hampshire County Friends of the Homeless opened a six-bed overflow in East Hampton at um, Our Lady of the Valley Parish, I think has been recently renamed. Um, and that is on its seventh year, and that's in collaboration with the staff, ServiceNet staff, the Interfaith Shelter, Hampshire County Friends of the Homeless, as well as Soldier On. Um, Soldier On does the transportation from Center Street to East Hampton and they do the staffing as well, and then Friends of the Homeless provide the meals. So it's actually, it's essentially about three shelter locations um, in the coldest winter months. So they pick them up, like at the Grove Street Inn? They pick them up right at Center Street, because oh. it's specific for the Interfaith Winter Shelter. It opens a couple or a few weeks post when the Interfaith opens, which is November 1st. And then they close a couple few weeks before the interfaith closes May 1st. So that opens six beds mm -hmm. right downtown through the majority, five of the six months that the winter interfaith is open. Both shelters we operate as a dry facility, which means uh, not allowing the use of alcohol or drugs on the property. So at the winter faith, winter faith, at the interfaith <laughs> winter shelter, um, it's essentially first come, first serve. There's 20 beds on site now the six overflow in East Hampton. 
Once an individual gets the bed, they have it every night so long as they're back by opening, which is 6 p.m. Um, we don't give a lot of lag time because sometimes there's three new people and we have potentially one new bed open. Mm -hmm. um, it works about um, at a monthly stay, so there is an expectation that folks who are staying there are connecting with the drop-in center, which I believe you've had a kind of session with Blondo regarding the drop-in center, and, the, and that's where case management for both shelters is based out of. So there is a bit of an expectation that those residents do connect with the caseworkers, so they are taking the steps, whatever their personal steps are, to move forward, to move out of the shelter. Um, not incredibly stringent versus with Grove Street, um, there is a far more accountability than at the winter winter mm -hmm. shelter, mm -hmm. just because the temperatures are low and we're not going to kick you out for not meeting with a caseworker or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's men and women, um, and we do have the capability when our census for women is high to change one of the dorms, because it's three dorms. Um, one with ten beds, one with eight beds, one with four beds. And we do have the ability to switch those dorms around to be able to shelter more women. That's a cool. Winter Both. interfaith shelter. Both have men and women, is that correct? Both have men and women. Yeah. <clears throat> Wait, the, you said there are 22 beds? Well, we have um, four, like, for example, if we'd only had a couple of women, there's 22 beds total, and that's for the ratio of men and women. If we've got two female beds open, we could put, you know, 18 <coughs> in the 10 and the, the 8. So it, it allows for some flexibility in that. And it also, um, you know, it's important that we absolutely stay at our capacity. Um, however, when it's negative something degrees out, it's nice that there are those extra beds for, for just an on-site overflow on occasion. Now, our Lady of the Valley, is that men and women also? That is all only men. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. Do you get spillover from there? They send people from there to here. Is that what you're something? Do you no, we. It's very closed. It is. It's incredibly closed. Um, there have only been maybe two people in the last seven years that have showed up at Our Lady of the Valley looking for a bed. Um, because it is, it's very closed. We, um, we screen the people who are going to be sent over. They've stayed with us at the Interfaith for a little while. We know who they are. They come to the cot shelter, to the Interfaith shelter before they go to East Hampton. Then they're dropped off from East Hampton directly back at our shelter so we can just check in with them. And so there's not really any like, spillover. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you find that, um, your services are being more and more needed. Needed now. Yeah. You do. Absolutely. There's a tremendous amount of like when the, the migration happens within Franklin, Hampshire, and Hamden County. And I yep. think you know the the effects of the tornado are in play a little bit um, more so on the family side, but that you know and the damage that's happened, the weather related stuff has caused an increase. And I think one, you know, one of the things we've seen in, is that I think the economics are just, it, it keeps working, you know, at that, yeah. you know, not the people that are necessarily the folks that we know, but the new faces that are coming in. The veterans are coming home, and that's becoming a problem because they don't have places to live, men and women. It has been, it's been obvious in the last four years that there are more and more people coming to our doors mm -hmm. for the the black and white financial reasons. You know, I lost my job, I went through my savings, used up couches, and here yeah, I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, we're, if you look in today's uh, Gazette, and you notice all of the foreclosures <clears throat> in Hampshire County yeah. that are happening right now, it gets more and more every week. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I think that's gonna play a part this year. Yeah. There's been a delay here in Hampshire County compared to some of the other, you know, yeah. oh, towns yeah. in Massachusetts. Springfield was 500 two yeah. months ago. Yeah. So, it's, you know, there's, um, it's a slippery slope right now. Yeah. And, uh, and I think one of the, you know, the issues is that, you know, 
on the back end, you know, I have people, I get a phone, I get three or four phone calls that say, look, I'm going to lose my apartment because I've run, you know, I had a job. I mean, yeah. people just tell you the whole story. And, you know, I just need somebody to help me find another place. Or people that are being evicted because of the foreclosures, mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. five or six units, they, they don't know where to turn to. And uh, they may be working somewhere in the Northampton area, but they can't find the affordable housing. We get, we, we get a lot more calls for that than we've had in the past. Yeah. And so it's, I think, you know, one of the things that's happened in, in funding for homes, the prevention services, where you had some pretty robust, well, here's, you had somebody come and work with you, okay, you're having a problem with the landlord, you're a couple months behind. Those services are the first thing they cut. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it was in in my you know my mind it was the wrong thing to cut. So. Yeah, uh, guy in the ward right now is losing his house. <clears throat> he got laid off two years ago. Has not been looking at a job since then. Yeah. And he has been through the sixty two thousand dollars that he had saved up. He's now broke. The money's gone. Yeah. And um, the bank is looking for his house now. And uh, so he has no idea where he's going to go. Yeah. Um, and his unemployment has run out. Yeah, yeah, a lot of stories. Yeah. A lot of those stories come into the door. Yeah. So now he's, out, he's got applications in at McDonald's and Burger King. And, and that's uh, what's happening. Yeah, the underemployed are yeah. pushing. Yeah. And you've got people I've had, you know, family run a family in and a Greenfield family in and uh, for six families. And there's six in the, in the shelter. There's 34 in the motel. Yeah. This guy's a graphics designer. You'd think he would be able to find employment. Yeah. Got to go down south. And he's good. Yeah. yeah. It's, not, huh. yeah. it's not easy. You got to. That's what you got to do. Try to relocate. There's no guarantee of that either. I wanted to ask you about. Um, I know Jay, Danielle, and Suzanne Stubbs, and I worked on a language on weather conditions. Mm -hmm. Now, that is definitely going to be put in place, right? Well, I mean, for this oh, year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've, just, to we've taken calls. it to a whole other level with the tornado and then the last snowstorm. And that. So, so you've added on now? Oh, we've, it, yeah, we just, we, tomorrow we have, you Could know. Could you email that to my phone? A meeting, yeah. We have a draft plan that's been done by the quality management. And we had a lot of discussion over the last couple of weeks about that. So we had 80 residential homes that were without power. Oh, good. Okay. Storm through Yeah. Yeah. So we've been on top of that. Okay. Thank you. you know, weather's becoming a big issue. Mm, yeah. How's the uh, rehab coming up at Grove, Grove Street? All done? Everything? All that's. All the CPA yeah. is fully complete. It's gone. All complete. Yeah. It's all completed. Um, it's gone out? as far as the money. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are, are all the rehabs done was the question. And yeah. No. Okay. But of what, what we had for the CPA, absolutely. Money is gone. What about the cabs? Did the cabs ever happen? Not as of yet. No. Not as the of kitchen yet. is another, is still, you know, something we're working towards. I mean, yeah. it's. I know Wayne's in coming in next month with Pat Keller. Oh, great. To talk about that. Yeah. Fabulous. Is there another application in for CPA in that? No. There isn't, huh? I believe uh, Ms. Keller advised us that the guidance about CPA funding yes. is, um, is has been negative. Yeah, yeah. I can't say when they had the the um, men's bathroom that was, if you recall. Oh yes. Yeah. It was you know gutted and uh, it was it was a little whole lot more work than was expected, understandably. Yep. Um, but but pretty neat. In the walls was a postcard from. Uh, 1819 or 1824. Wow. There was a postcard in the wall. Yeah, that was that was a neat little bit of history that came oh, out of the wall. Saved there were some other it. things in the wall. Saved it, framed it, did you? <laughs> Saved it, passed it around. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to say, with regards to the uh, interfaith winter shelter, that it is. And I mentioned collaborations, but it is fully co-run with, with Hampshire County Friends of the Homeless. It, it really couldn't happen. They've got about a team of about 400 volunteers that help with meal and um, overnight support as well. So it's a, it's a real community. community. Can you explain to me the stack and rolls? I'm really concerned about that. 
at the Grove Street Inn and the Underfaith Shelter. Do you have permanent staff there? I mean, they're gone in the morning, correct? They leave in the morning? And both, yeah. Okay, because that was an issue last year. They leave, what, at 8 o'clock? For Grove Street, it's 8 a.m. Yeah, for, except for if the weather's bad, they do not leave. Right, right. Okay, so, but once somebody stays with them, and the weather is bad, you're supposed to be notified because that's the language I have, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So what do you do, stay there with them all day? Yeah, it would be the same as, as in the evening, the three, you know, we open at 4 p.m. at Grove Street and 6 p.m. at the, at the winter shelter. Um, so it's the same rules if we had to stay open during the day for whatever the reason so may be. So you could call somebody in, right? If we have to stay open during the day. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, we have a backup on-call system. We have myself and we have, we have Wanda as well. And staffing. The team's pretty, pretty good about covering if that's necessary. And then the heads up, you know, to the overnight. You know, we're getting X amount of inches anticipated. So if it's not bad weather, they leave at 8 o'clock in the yeah. morning. Then they come back at 4. At Grove Street, yes. At Grove Street Inn. Yes. And how many staff? So Grove Street is a 21-bed facility, men and women, with one staff member on at all times, aside from change of shift when there's two staff members. Um, the staff is all, all the staff have been there for at minimum a year or longer. Um, the, their roles are primarily um, ensuring uh, safety and being a presence on the on site, doing inspections, um, mm -hmm. helping just you know folks get through a bad day, triaging phone calls. Um. So if they should, if staff should need help, say somebody has a problem. Yeah. So they just get on the phone to on call, and who comes? Well, not if there's a problem. Nobody's always necessarily coming. I, it's very specific to what the problem might be. Well, I'm talking um, about a behavior problem. A behavioral problem, a major behavioral problem that staff can't handle. It's, it's the Northampton Police Department. Well, police That's force, all I want to know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's a great relationship um, through my eyes with the Northampton Police Department. They're really responsive. That, so that's good to know that. And, yeah. Really responsive and really fair. You know, um, good, good team. Let me ask you a really pointed question. Okay. The Grove Street. And it's a it's between ServiceNet and the city of Northampton. Yes. Yep. Do you desire it to stay that way, or could it all be ServiceNet? Well, one of the issues around the funding, in terms of you know, if we just if we took over that building, we would not be able to build based on you know for a lot of those, seeing how that there's a rent that we can we can pay rent but as soon as we take ownership. HUD and federal guidelines won't allow it, won't allow us to, to bill off on that. We only bill for rent utilities. Um, so, you know, the funding issue would be, and I think the cost of, you know, I mean, if you get worried about that, you know, the facility way down the road, not necessarily, at the, the building's in decent shape now, but, and it's in pretty decent shape for a shelter that has <coughs> that much traffic, you know, year round. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we kind of like our partnership because that... I think know, it's been a great partnership. That gives us the, the, you know, it gives us just a little more safety around the financial. Okay. Because we just about squeak by every year. You know? I, well, I know that. That's why, I, yeah. that's why I brought it up because there has been some back and forth. Um, yeah. On, and also, like, even, like, the Florence Grammar School mm -hmm. and things. Um, okay. Yeah. I kind of like the partnership. Yeah, we do too. Okay. We think it's we well, you know, homelessness is a community issue, and yep. um, I think the Northampton community is very responsive to. You know, I think we're a great partnership. Yeah, and I so would rather leave it with the city mm -hmm. and with ServiceNet. That's the way it's been. There's a connection there, and we're out of that box. We're expanding, and we have all these communities coming in working together. But I know Absolutely. Owen wants yeah. to. Speak. No. Yeah. Uh, it's a hell of a resource, that's yeah. why I was asking. But yeah, yeah. there's been grumbles, you know, there's, there's budget here, there's cuts here, there's... Yeah. I know. And, um, and it's, this year is a disaster. 
yeah, I mean, coming up. So yeah. uh, even our CDBG money yeah. is going away, right. which I'm sure you know. Yep. Um, and that's a, that is another piece that's really going to because that's seventeen thousand. You know, yeah. Pays for half the staff Absolutely. position. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. So it's and we're already bare bones on the staffing. So you know. That's I, I, I talked to that Carol Lang at the HUD office. Yeah. And she's a director of the CDBG money, and she is not optimistic. Yeah. That's Have you good. talked with them at all, Trey? Uh, yeah, we know it's yeah it's you know there's 17 there. The interface shelter is 15, so that's 32,000 yep. dollars. And in uh, the in the funding gap that we have now, we use to make it up in donations and Shelter Sunday. Yeah. And Shelter Sunday, I heard that that's down. That it was a. It, if you remember, the day itself was just yeah. really rainy it was and a gloomy. Crappy day. It was yeah. a cruddy day, which we're hoping yeah. was the main reason, and that um, people will be sending donations in, yeah. in the meantime. Yeah. Yeah. Now you have a big fundraiser coming up. We in do. December. In two and a half. Yeah, December second. Two yeah. weeks. Less than two weeks. Right. I know we all the counselors are. I know Corrine. Is taking reservations for that. I go every year. Yeah. And it's fantastic. Yeah. Is that sat on that CBG with, with Marianne Labarge? Yeah. That's $35 yeah. per yeah. ticket. And we really right. kicked around uh, just What's exactly the what to do with, the, with a little bit of money that was there. Yeah. And right there. we oh, broke oh, it up into, into shelter yeah. and food. And evening yeah. of hope, 6 o'clock. You know, I mean, they were the, most yes. the two most important December things on the, on the list were food and shelter. Yes. Yeah. I was absolutely. I was, and then having to, what is, where is the? Oh, I was very thankful because I, you know, thought for sure, we, you know, that was it. Yeah, but there was some. You know, we had some repetitive applications, didn't we, Marianne, that we looked yes. at. And mm -hmm. I have to say, with the CDBG grants, I've been working on them for a long, long time, and I think we're going to be in the same situation as we were this year. We're going to be looking at a decrease of money. Yeah. So. Food, right? Shelter. Yeah. That's what we're going to do. I actually recommended five percent split, didn't we, on that? Yeah. On um, the administration of the fund, because the fund is getting smaller and smaller. <coughs> so we were spending twenty percent of the money to administer the fund, yeah. and it was only five hundred thousand dollars or six hundred thousand dollars, and three hundred thirty-eight thousand of it was gone immediately. To fund the senior center, yep. and you take the 330 plus 100 thousand dollars out the 20 percent, left you about 68 thousand yeah. dollars, and we were spending 100 thousand dollars to administer the 68 thousand. Yeah. So as the fund, we were up to we had 1.1 million dollars at one point, yeah. and yeah. Um, and she says it's going to be even, it could be 25 percent less this coming year, and I think the 16 percent, I think we were lucky it was only that much of a cut. Well, they've got it cut over $2.2 trillion. Yeah. You know, even with the CWG grants with our applicants, we had great concerns because a lot of the um, private agencies, okay, are almost similar to what the service net might be or others. And should we be looking at combining them? Okay, so that drops the cost there. I don't know. There's, it's a big uh, issue here because if we keep losing money, somebody's not going to get the money. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, at this point, the mergers aren't, you know, people talk about doing mergers and what a cost savings it is. And um, being part of emerging agencies, I ran into ServiceNet, you know, Meridian Associates, and we ran programs in Belchertown and Greenfield and Pittsfield. And, um, and, you know, you just don't, it's, you, you've already been through that kind of cut and having your administration bare bones. When you put it together, you're not really, you're not picking up the, and you, I, you just can't, it's hard to make, you know, some of the legislators and the public understand that. It just, there's not, there's not the money there to, to grab to, there's the savings just don't exist. How just, many volunteers do you have? There's 400. Well, with the, with the interfaith shelter, it's about 400 between um, dinner cooks, Smith College students come for a couple hours a week, mm -hmm. um, or sorry, a couple hours a night at the shelter, as well as overnight support staff. Uh -huh. um, and then there's a, probably, I think, if I were to guess, about 60 or so with regards to Grove Street and providing meals twice a week 
which then helps with our, you know, keeping our food last longer mm -hmm. that we have, that our monies are getting. The, the conversations are going to come up this year in this, um, just everybody, and we all know it, yeah. uh, things like the man's soup kitchen, they get $2,500, it, it seems like a, it's a pittance, yeah. you know, it's, it's a very small amount of money, but they had also said to us that if they didn't get the $2,500, they weren't going to close down. This is the way it's always been for years. With so, them, they never ask for money, Counselor, yep. and you've heard us yep. say that. Yep. Okay. To them, they get it or they don't. Yeah. Which is really, I think, one of the bonuses of this community is its honesty. And and with a program like MANA, who provides a very needed resource. The Rumble. Saying, yeah, absolutely. You know, I know everyone's bad. struggling, so we can make it. Yeah. Without it. Yeah, but we did give them the, the we did <laughs> allow them the twenty five hundred dollars, and it was like you wanted to give them more because you watch it. You, you look at their budget and what they operate on; it was almost How zero. Do it. Yeah. And um. But so many people come forth to help them out. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just thinking That's about great. what's happening this we next just, this coming year. But you are too. We are yeah. strapping ourselves in. You know, I mean, it's it, it's called. You know, part of what I need to do is, you know, we're chasing every small twenty five hundred dollar, five thousand dollar kind of grant that's out there. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's twenty six funding sources for housing and shelter already. So that you know, I'm going to look and say, well, can we get more out of Project Bread? Can we get more? You know, and they just cut the fuel. Half assistance, that right went half. half, so we just get that notification. Um, United Way's um, emergency food assistance program, that got major cut. And self help. Cut. So I helped a resident, a couple of them last year, and this year they were cut. Yeah. So, dial self help? Mm -hmm. yeah. they were, they were and good. especially for their fuel assistance. Yeah, the, the fuel, yes. they were 68% yeah. short last year and what they actually needed operate and now they've cut them again they've cut them in half this year mm -hmm. so That's if it was 68 year last year it's got to be um, yeah. I hey I paid 30 260 bucks to heat my house last year of course oil hit four dollars a gallon so I can't imagine um, what will hit this year yeah yeah it's up there can we talk about your funding sources? Sure. Yeah, Jay has a lot of that, um, the, the specifics and the dollars. Well, the, uh, okay. yeah. Well, Grove Street, where, you know, the major funding source is the uh, DHCD um, funding from the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, that is, uh, runs about 167000 and then, you know, CDBG was 17. Um, United Way funded 30,000 last year, uh, which was a surprise. We thought that was going to get cut, but they maintained their funding. Um, Those 30,000? Yeah. United Way. Wow. Yeah. That surprised us. So that was much needed. The um, Citizens Energy was 1,300. And Project Bread was three thousand. So in those other grants, that was you know the the total revenue for the program is two hundred thirty-five thousand. We Shelter Sunday was ninety-five hundred, and other miscellaneous donations are coming through the year was about eight thousand. So it was about two hundred thirty-five thousand dollars of revenue. And. Um, you know, the overall budget is, you know, I budgeted it down a little bit, trying to leave a little cushion, and um, our expenses are running about 225000 We'll end up using the whole, something oh, yeah. will come up somewhere along the yeah. line. Um, in, in the interface shelter that runs, you know, for the six months, that has a total revenue of um, $109,000. And um, you know our expenses are around 102, but the uh, then again we get another about 40,000 from DHCD. Um, we have an ESG, it's Emergency Solutions Grant, uh, which is from DH. That's a that's a federal. 
that passes through DHCD. Um, that's about 11,000. No, that, that's not part of your total. This is the, the interface total revenue? This, no, this is the interface shelter. So okay. this is all part of the total revenue. I'm just, I was just breaking them down a little bit. Okay. So it's really over, over 50 from 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 DHCD. But yeah. some is federal, some yeah. state. Yeah, and then 15,000 from CDBG. And um, and the, the, the Friends of the Homeless uh, contribute about 15,000. How much? Wow. 15,000. No kidding. Yeah. Is that in kind or is that is that the uh, No, that's cash. uh that's actual cash. Hmm. And then you know donations run about twelve thousand there. I'm sorry to disturb you, but somebody's parked behind my car. Oh, that's me, I'm sorry. Okay. And you are? <laughs> <laughs> kitchen window. Did a number in our house. Spent the whole day inside trying to get out. It ruined everything. Oh, God. Mm. So is there Blood. any more to talk about on the finances? No, but the finances, That's you know, they're, they're not real complicated budgets. You know, it's money in, money out. And you just hope it's, but you know, we've always had a, had a struggle with the housing and sheltering services in the agency of, you know, breaking even. And um, you know, historically, I think ServiceNet has made some money in other places to take up for some short shortfalls here. You know, uh, I think Sue has made Stubb has made a commitment to that yeah. over the oh, years. You know, um, yeah. So that's kind of the contribution to the the community that the agency makes. And there's been, I think, some years some fairly significant funds in the fifty to eighty thousand yeah. dollar range. It's, it's a tough shuffle. Well, we, we did pretty good last year, you know, we did yep. some, some things and we were only about 5,000 short. That's the best it's been in a lot of years, but <laughs> yeah. what I'm looking at this year is uh, going to be a struggle. So, but hopefully our grant writing is a little more robust. I want to thank you, thank Jay you. and Danielle, okay. for you. being here, yep. and happy holidays. Okay. Same you too. You. Thank you for inviting we'll us. We'll see maybe oh. all of you at yeah. the yeah. Evening of Hope. Speaking of the holidays, uh, the holidays, how are you guys are you're preparing a big meal at the Groves, or, or, or how's this going? Yeah. How are the holidays happening in the shelters? So at the Interfaith Shelter, it's again um, volunteers who've committed to providing dinner. And um, at Christmas, uh, one of the on Christmas, one of the synagogues actually comes in, and it's really a very festive, festive yeah. evening at the winter shelter. And at Grove Street, one of the um, longest paid workers at our drop-in center has, for the last I'd say maybe ten years, has provided has he makes the dinner with the guests, stays the night on the couch gets the whole dinner together. At Grove Street, we invite other folks there as well who are at some of the local rooming houses or that we know might not have somewhere to go and yeah. are always welcome at the holidays. And you've got all that food covered and everything? We make that happen. Yeah. Absolutely. Every year. <laughs> no, I get it. I get Everyone it. deserves their candy yeah. yams. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Okay. Have a good For day. everything you do. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Well, this is open to the public now. I don't know, maybe Emily, would you like to speak on anything? Um, I'm good. <laughs> You're good? Oh, yeah. She wants to get home and see the Patriots. <laughs> <laughs> I move we adjourn. I second. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> I want to go home and see the Patriots. What's happening?